thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. Thanks for the conference organizers for having me here. I want to thank you all for being here this morning early. So I want to talk about something that uh, affects every single one of us involved in developing software. Uh, our goal uh, in, in our work is to deliver value to our clients. And we go to work with uh, a good ambition of doing exactly that. But a lot of times what happens is that things kind of become really hard for us to manage when we have to deal with a lot of different issues, including one that I've felt with quite a bit is complexity. Well, I want to start by saying that when I was a child, I used to tell a lot of scary stories. Now I'm grown up, I just talk about programming. And that is as scary or scarier than what I used to uh, say before. And uh, I'm a consultant. I travel around the world. I work with companies uh, in helping them deliver software. And uh, what I'm going to talk about here for the next about 50 minutes or so is purely things I've observed personally, things I've come to realize based on what uh, my own clients and various other companies I worked with have actually seen and have been dealing with. And part of the reason why I want to talk about these things is if we can identify some of these issues when we go back to work, we can maybe avoid or at least work towards improving these things. Uh, some of these are familiar to us, but a lot of times, just because something is familiar doesn't mean we act upon it. A uh, gentle reminder can help us a great deal to really nudge just towards the right direction. And so that's what I want to spend time on today, is talk about things we can do and improve what we do in our work. Well, first of all, of course, we all heard these statements over and over and over. The only constant is change. Well, I work with a lot of companies, like I said, and when I go to companies, one of the things they want to tell me very quickly is, they say, when can we are agile? And I always tell them, I'm so glad we got that out of the way. Now let's talk about what you actually do. And what I want to really ask the question is, what does it really mean to be agile? And I'm going to say the single most important thing for me when it comes to agile development is, are we really being adaptive? That's the most critical question to ask. It's not about stand-up meeting. It's not about Scrum Master. It's not about a lot of things we do. The question really to ask is, are we really adaptive? If we are not adaptive, then it doesn't really make any sense at all to say that we are agile. And I'm going to be saying that probably I'm a little ashamed of the uh, tweet I po posted, but it turned out to be the most impopular tweet I've ever posted because it probably got the most number of retweets ever uh, to, uh, to the surprise of everyone that knew uh, when I posted this. And, and the tweet is this, and, and my tweet was kind of random because I was actually having food with my children in a restaurant, and suddenly this thought came to me, and I tweeted this. And, and here's what I said. And I said, I've set the wedding date. I've not asked her out yet. This is how projects are managed. And if you really think about it, this is so true about how software projects are really done, isn't it? You're working on this project, and they tell me, we have decided on the scope. We decided when the delivery of the project is going to be. And then I look at them and ask them, then what's there to be agile? There is absolutely no sense in saying we are agile when we have decided all of these things up front, and yet we want to really be proud to say we are agile. And I think agile is just the rewording of waterfall. It just makes it feel better to say it. So the question really is, if we really want to be agile, and I want to say one of the words I really emphasize when it comes to agile development is the word sustainability. Are we able to sustain the pace of developing software, especially when we have to constantly change when the requirements change, when the needs of the customers change, when the environment changes, when the libraries we depend on change, everything around us changes. How capable are we to sustain the pace of development? That's a question we should really ask, uh, ask ourselves. So from that point of view, I'm going to say complexity makes it really hard to adapt to change. There's a lot of things that really make it hard for us to adapt to change, but one of the things I've noticed consistently is that complexity makes it really hard for us to adapt to change. But let's not be naive about it. I'm going to say system design is complicated by nature. When you're working on that banking application, when you're working on that medical application, when you're working on that tax application, when you're working on that uh, application that is monitoring uh, uh, airplanes that are in flight, none of those is really things that are easy to do. So we are dealing with enormous amount of complexity, and complicated things is the nature of our lives to deal with. 
we are in a profession where uh, computer uh, uh, programming and computer software uh, is, is probably the most vital aspect of any, any, uh, the human society today because we use software in every single aspect of uh, our, our lives. And, and in fact, we're getting to the point where we're doing more and more critical things with software where the cost of failure could become really high as time goes on. So as a result, we need to be appreciative of the fact that we are building things that are absolutely complicated. But unfortunately, though, we take what's already complicated and we add complexity to that in, in, uh, and make things even worse. So what is complicated becomes even worse when we add complexity to it. And if we can find a way to remove that complexity, I think we can do a lot better with it. So in terms of complexity, I want to talk about two types of complexity that is something we need to identify as developers. One is inherent complexity. The inherent complexity is the complexity that comes from the problem domain. It's a complexity of the application, the nature of the science and engineering that we have to deal with and the problem domain itself. We cannot remove inherent complexity from the problem itself. We can try to manage it. But unfortunately, as developers, we don't deal with that most of the time. What really hurts us is the accidental complexity. So while inherent complexity is the nature of the problem we deal with, it's the accidental complexity that really hurts us. But where does accidental complexity come from? The accidental complexity comes from the solution we are using to solve problems. And when we use a solution, the complexity the solution introduces, what do we typically do? We bring in more solutions to deal with that problem. And those solutions, in turn, bring in accidental complexity. And we get dragged into this vicious cycle. And all of a sudden, we are spending all of our effort dealing with this complexity that we kind of introduced to the problem than it being in there uh, in the, uh, to begin with. So what I'm going to talk about is, how can we deal with it? Well, we are the victims of our own complexity. And if we can remove that complexity, we can do a lot better. And I'm going to argue that we, the people, the programmers, are the, are the right people to do it. Because we are the technical people. We understand these kinds of complexities. And if we don't take the time and effort to remove them, there is absolutely no hope in the world to make these manageable. So it's our uh, professional responsibility to be able to handle this. So I'm going to talk about things I've observed in my experience. Where does complexity really come from? And what really makes software systems complex? So the first thing I want to talk about is the first complexity I've seen is too many moving parts. Now, this is one of the things I'm, I'm sure every one of us face every single day in our experience, too many moving parts. And if you look around your own application and identify what are those moving parts, and I think this is only getting worse by the year that we are working with. Well, as a beautiful quote by Leslie Lamport, he says, a distributed system is one in which a failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. If you really think about the world we live in today, you're on your mobile devices, and the minute you click on the device's surface to the time you get a response, literally, there are thousands of failure points between those two uh, points in time. So when you click on the button and the time you see the response, it's a miracle that actually things even work because there are so many things that are in there. This is even getting worse today with the microservices where we live in because there are literally hundreds if not thousands of services that are in the background that are just crying to fail at any given time. And the more the moving parts, the more complexities to maintain. So one of the things I would challenge developers to ask the question is, ask if that is the right technology for the problem at hand, because your solution should never be more complex than the problem it's trying to solve. And if we go down the path of creating more complexity, we are really leaving things behind for other people to deal with. I was at a client site recently, and it occurred to me, and I tweeted this, these words. And, and what I said was, a technical debt is the gift a developer leaves for the generation of programmers that come after them. And that is something we have to ask the question. Your actions have a very deep ramification for people who come after you for developing your systems and maintaining it. And how many times have you sat down to curse the people that have gone before you? And I would rather be cursed less in my experience. So if I can do a little bit to minimize that, I think we've done a better job. 
Well, one of the things that, uh, that I came across was a pretty shocking experience. I was working with a client where uh, they came into a market where they really had, they, they say pathway to hell is created on good intentions. They came with a really good intention, and the intention was they wanted to customize and deliver a software for their, exper uh, their client's experience. And in doing so, when, I, when they called me to do a code review and help them to improve their software, I was in a bit of a shock. Because when I started looking at their code, I'm not even kidding, I could see so much code deliberately making decisions based on who the customer is that the product is deployed to. And then when I asked them a few more questions, they took me to a configuration file. They created a software so that it can be customized so much that you won't even recognize it's the same software running on two different clients' machines. When I asked them very curiously how this works, they showed me an XML configuration file, and you cannot imagine every single thing you can ever think of can be configured in that XML file. And then they told me that they have a team of people who spend four months customizing the XML file so they can deliver the software to their customers. This came to a point after 10 years in the field, every single change would cost them a lot of time and money. And suddenly, where they were really agile and fast, now they were extremely slow and error prone. They just could not keep up with it. And what I noticed was excessive configuration really came to kill their product and their ability to deliver software over time. Unnecessary layers and unnecessary complexity and components really made it hard for them. And, and when I looked at their configurations, uh, it was unbelievable. And I realized configuration XML, at least in their project, I'm sure in other projects too, uh, configuration XML is configuration from hell. And this was really hard to work with. And when I started working on it, I came to a realization that XML is, you know, XML has been around for a while, and I, I, I was working in the field before the time of XML. And when XML was introduced, it looked like a bright idea for a very short amount of time. And then you realize, I realized something. That X, this is my analysis of what XML is. XML is like humans. They're very cute when they are small, becomes really annoying when they get bigger. And this becomes absolutely unmanageable, and it becomes horrible for us to deal with. And this is one of the things I noticed is that the more we end up getting dragged into this, the harder it is for us to really sustain the agility of development. So when it comes to configuring, we should really ask the question, is this really worth configuring or should we not even go over there? So in other words, when you look at an application, ask the question, what is the cost of developing this software? If during development you find it hard to maintain the code, if during development it becomes expensive to identify and fix problems, if during development you find it hard to deploy, these are early signs of warning that it's going to become a total mess in the, in the, in the later times for the entire organization to support this software. Where the software becomes really brittle, it becomes error prone, it's really hard to deploy, hard to test, and hard to reason. And that is one of the things I want to really emphasize is this idea of hard to test. And over over and over and over, I begin to realize this particular concern among, among teams. So we, we all work in a uh, world where we use euphemisms. And sometimes we don't tell the real nasty truth. We say polite words. So when I work with teams, I often hear people say, this software is hard to test. Now I know what they really mean when they say it. What they really say is uh, the, the design uh, of, uh, well, what they say when they say the software is hard to test is they say the design of this software sucks. That's what they really mean. So usually it's a really nice reflection. When a system is really hard to test, it truly is a reflection of poor quality of design in it. And, and so as a result, I always ask people, I don't want a software to be testable. Well, that's an after the effect. I want it to be 
tested. And I don't want just to say, in theory, it's testable. I want them to test it thoroughly using automated means that if you cannot do it, that's an early sign of warning. The design is really bad, and we need to recover from that very quickly. So from that point of view, we want to really focus on reducing the complexity by avoiding the moving parts. Testability is also one reflection, because the more of the moving parts it is, the expensive it is to test your software as well. That's a good reflection to deal with it very quickly. The next thing I want to talk about here is something I'm still very angry about. And, and the reason I'm very angry about is there are two things I value the most in this world. One is my time, and the other is other people's time. And anything that wastes our time is, uh, is really the worst thing we could do, I think. Well, invisible changes, and I came across this, and, and I'm still bitter about it, like I said. Well, a team came to me and they said they had written code in C++, and they wanted me to re-implement this code using modern tools, and, and because I was aware of some of these things, they said, can you help us with this? And I shouldn't have said yes, but I really wanted to help. I said, sure. And the next thing you know, they sent me the C++ code. Just to set the stage, I am not new to C++ at all. In fact, C++ is the one language I would say I probably work with the longest in my life. I started programming in C++ a good 35 years ago. I spent a good 15 years teaching C++ in the university as well. My corporate life have programmed C++ extensively in. I've kept up with the changes in C++. I know what's going on in C++ 11, 12, 11, 7, uh, 14, and 17. And I'm so pretty aware of C++, I can read the code. But yet, I read this code they had sent me. And for the life of me, I could not understand what was going on. And the more I read it, the more stupid I, I felt. And I got really uh, frustrated because I could not understand what the code was doing. And then I started doing something ridiculous. I started stepping through the debugger. And I'm here in the constructor. As I'm walking through the constructor, there is a function that has a name called get something. And to me, get something means it's going to fetch some data to you. And I step over that, I step over that one function, and a boatload of state gets loaded into this class. I'm like, whoa, how did that happen? Now I'm stepping through that rabbit hole, stepping in the function, and then another function. Very soon, I'm lost where I am. And as I was doing this, I came to realize that I would never be able to understand this code. And then I wrote to them and said, do me a favor. Is this code written based on some kind of a research paper or algorithm that's published? And they said, of course. And they pointed me to the research paper where the algorithm is described. I, I abandoned the code, read the algorithm. I'm not even kidding with you. Read the paper wrote the code, got it working, sent it to them and said, never talk to me again. And then this is how angry I was because it wasted so much of my time trying to understand what the code was doing. And then I realized, when I, you know, you want to take your anger and convert it to some understanding. And this is my understanding after the fact. There are two kinds of code that frustrate me the most. The first kind of code is the one that won't work. And I'm staring at the saying, why won't you work? The second piece of code is the one that works but shouldn't. And both of these are horrible. And I'm just absolutely looking at this code. It's like, why does this even work? And I'm not sure exactly why it's working. And, and then I realized that people who write code that makes invisible change are absolutely cruel to other programmers. Because it's a cost of your time, your money, and your effort. And we always say the code should be transparent. Why? Because you want to walk the reader and set the stage for they understand and anticipate what the code is doing. And the farther we go away from it, the more expensive it becomes to develop software. So invisible changes are yet another complexity to software. So when we start sit down to write the code, we have to ask ourselves, are we increasing the accidental complexity by making these changes invisible, or are we removing that complexity from code? That's something we have to really ask the question. And so don't sneak around and start changing state, because that becomes really hard for us to deal with. And this results in enormous amount of time wasted on the, on the code as well. And we can really have an economic impact by reducing that kind of complexity in code. The next thing I want to talk about here 
is about uncontrolled mutability. Now think about this for a little bit. We all know mutability is not the most pleasant thing to do. But if you go to any Java programmer, C-sharp programmer, C++ programmer, almost any other language that we use in the mainstream, and you tell them don't do mutability, they kind of look at you strange and say, what are you talking about? We live in the world of mutability. So I'm going to say mutability is OK. We all do this. But what about sharing? Well, sharing is a good thing. Remember what mom told us. You have to share. That's, a, that's, that's what you should do as a nice person. So mutability is OK. Sharing is good. But shared mutability is devil's work. And the minute you bring shared mutability, all kinds of things fall apart. It becomes a nightmare to deal with. So what can we do to reduce one kind of complexity is to minimize mutability as much as we can. But when it comes to mutability, I'm going to say there are certain things in life that are predictively irrational. I want you to just spend a minute thinking about it. Well, when Java was introduced, what did we have in Java? We had a thread class. I know we don't use thread class today, but we use executor services and other thread pools. But that didn't change one thing fundamental. What did we send to the thread class? We often sent a runnable. And today, with executor services, we still use runnable quite a bit. But what do we do with runnable? Well, think about the runnable interface, if you will. What is the method of the runnable interface? It is public void, and then it says run. Now, just stare at that for a minute. What does that interface tell you? I will not take anything from you, and I won't give anything back to you. How rude. If you really think about it, you sometimes work with people like that, isn't it? They won't listen to you, and they won't talk to you either. And how do you communicate when you have a piece of code? This is unbelievable because the only way you can effectively use runnable is by adding shared mutability. Now think about that for a minute. It, the only way to use this API is to do the very damn thing you shouldn't be doing in the first place. Now, how do we deal with, how do you cope with logically systems like this? So it, it turns out that from the get-go, this really makes our life a lot harder to deal with. When it comes to this, of course, I'm going to say mutability needs company. It often hangs around with bugs. So the more mutability we introduce in code, the more difficult it is to maintain the code, the harder it is to reason with it, and the code becomes error prone as well. So any effort we can put in to reduce mutability is something we can actually benefit from quite a bit. And I'm going to go to the extent of saying that state transition causes brain damage. And, and the more we deal with, it becomes really, really hard. Now, you know one statement that we often hear from people? People say programmers are weird, programmers are antisocial, and things like that. I completely disagree with that. I think programmers are definitely social, but among the right kind of people, in my opinion. And it turns out, that one of the reasons why we appear like that is we spend a lot of time thinking. A lot of what we do is in our head. And, and I'm sure you have felt this quite a number of times uh, in your own experience. You're sitting at work, and you are coding away. Maybe there's some music playing around you, doesn't matter. But you're coding, and you're focused on it. Sometimes you're looking at the floor, you're looking at the ceiling, and you're just thinking. And what you've been doing at this point is, in your mind, you have been constructing this state in your mind. In your mind, you know this object is talking to this other object, which in turn is talking to this third object, which is about to send message to the fourth object. And you are in this beautiful state of unbelievable understanding of how the system works. And at that fateful moment, somebody opens the door and says, have you had lunch? And you just stare at them. You're looking at them, and you're not speaking. And they're like, I'm sorry, I asked you, have you had lunch? And you're like, what? And they look at you and say, you're weird. And they walk away. And then you're like very angry at this point. And then they open the door and say, are you OK? And you're like, no. And you have to put this all back in your head now, because all this model you created has been shattered, and it's on the floor. And only programmers understand this. You could have two people sitting and working together, and they have the shared model in their mind. And the third per person interrupts and asks something unrelated, and they both get angry at this person. Now, 
this is something I've learned over the time, or more, I should say, my family has learned over the time. And my wife, it, it, I, 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 there's nobody else in the world I respect more than my wife. And the reason I have such a respect for her is she is the most patient person I ever know. She didn't know this. She thought she married me. But then she realized she married a programmer. And this was a distinction that she had to really go through. When we were married new, uh, there was one time she came to me and said, I'm going to go shopping. And I told her, I will be done with this in five minutes if you want to wait. And then I saw her pick up the key and leave. And I was kind of a little bitter. And when she came back, I looked at her and said, I'm sorry, sweetie, I'm a little upset. I told you I'll be with you in five minutes, but I, you just kind of left. I was a little you know, angry, upset about it. And she put her hands on my shoulder and said, sweetie, let me tell you this once because I'm going to say, say this only once to you. You don't understand this. When you say five minutes, that is usually seven hours in the real world. And that's when I understood programmers have a different person of perception of time. How many times have you told your boss, I'm almost done? And the boss is like having the frustration of life and saying, what do you mean you're almost done? You say this every single time. And you're like, seriously, I'm almost done. We have this absolute uh, you know, uh, 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 perception of reality that's skewed from what the world is looking at. But I'll tell you, the best money that I ever paid for in my life was to go watch the social network movie. I'm going to play an audio here, so let's make sure the audio is up on the computer. So I'm going to play a little audio, but this one, right in the middle of the scene, my wife literally screamed. So I'll play this and I'll then talk about it. So here we go. I didn't know we had a doorbell. Andrew, get the door! No, he's wired in. That's he's wired in. He's security deposit. Andrew, knock down. Good boy. I'm Sean Parker. Oh, he's wired in. That's what I'm talking about. So right then, when Sean Parker heard he's wired in, my wife literally screamed, and I was like, are you okay? And she's like, now I understand when you're working, you're wired in. I'm like, take my money. This is worth it. And a week goes by. I was working in the kitchen when one of my kids came around and asked a question, and my wife said, don't talk to dad right now, he is wired in. I'm like, yes. And, and this is one of the most important things I realized is when people understand how programmers work, and I'm going to say happiness is when the world understands programmers, because then I think we can just live in harmony. And when you sit there and write your code, and you are in absolute sync with your code, and only another programmer can truly understand and appreciate that. But when the family begins to realize it, the family knows what really means to you as a programmer, and they're absolutely supportive to us. So, so one of the things is that this mutable state, we have to load in our mind, and all that complexity really introduces what we call as cognitive load. And the more the cognitive load is, the more expensive it is to develop software. So if there is a way we can reduce this cognitive load, I think we can do a lot better when it comes to developing software and making it easier to maintain, and in the process, making it a little less expensive. The next thing I want to talk about here is lack of cohesion. So what is lack of cohesion? Let me ask you the question, how many of you believe long methods are a good idea? Raise your hand if you think so. Not a single person raises the hand. Let me ask you a different question entirely. How many of you have seen long methods at work? Now the hands go up right away, isn't it? This is called cognitive dissonance. But I got a good news for you. Those long methods, I'm here to tell you, you didn't write them. I mean, you just told me a minute ago you don't believe in long methods. But the bad news is those people who believe long methods are a good idea are at work today making those methods longer as we speak. Well, the point really is, that's an example of lack of cohesion. Uh, you look at a long method and somebody asks the question, what does this method do? My question always is, what does it not do? Because it is doing so many things after all, it becomes really hard to maintain such a piece of code. So we want to really focus on cohesion. Now, cohesion is where a piece of code is narrow, focused, and does one thing and one thing really well. And I remember this experience working with a client. And this particular company has a, a software they've been maintaining for 30 plus years. 
And, and I'm absolutely humbled when I walk into their building because they have people working there who wrote the very first line of code on their software. And I would go sit down next to them and they would look at me and say, you know, I wrote the first line of code in that software. And it's very humbling. And these people are still working there trying to decide if they would retire first or die first. And, and this is just amazing to see software in one version control for past 30 years. And one of the developers called me and said, let me show you something, Venkat, he took me to his computer. And he takes this version control, shows me a function 15 years ago. This was the day the function was born. I could see this beautiful function, its entire body in front of me. And such a small little fingers, cute as you can think of, very small, only two parameters. And I was like, wow, Thomas McCabe's cyclomatic complexity value of 10 is considered to be high. This function only had a complexity value of five. And I was like praising this function the day it was born. And then he looked at me and said, don't get carried away, Venkat. And then he grabs the timeline and moves it to the current date. And as he was doing it, in front of me, I saw that beautiful little function literally turn into a monster. And don't even ask me how many parameters this function took today. And I could not see its bottom anymore. And then he showed me the cyclomatic complexity value of that function, a value of 864. And then he said, that's what we do to code in this company. I'm like, where's the nearest door? I want to exit. It is kind of scary if we don't refactor the code and let it grow into a monster over all the time. Well, one of the things to really think about is how can we really make the code, uh, reduce the code's complexity, if you will, and how do we really reduce the complexity of code, and what is the reason for it? One reason is it helps us to reduce the frequency of change of the code, and that's one of the reasons to do it. And so if we can create modular code, and whether the modularity is in a function or a class or a component or a microservice, whatever that layer of uh, uh, granularity is, if we can make it modular, I think we can do a lot better and keep it very cohesive. That's one thing we can do to reduce complexity. But the next thing I want to talk about is excessive dependencies. And every single one of us have to deal with it every single day. Now, dependencies are natural. We have to live with dependencies. But we also have to govern it quite a bit as well because dependencies can become really hard to maintain it. Well, I'm going to say, when I started programming a few decades ago, we, I lived in a different world than we do today. But there is consistently something I've noticed in the past about 30 plus years I've been uh, writing software. And that is, I've, held, I've had a one hell of a programming career, from a DLL hell to jar hell, through assembly hell to NPM hell, what is next is the question I want to ask. But NPM, of course, is special. NPM will, the minute you call it, it will download the entire internet with vengeance. I was on the flight the other day, and I had my laptop turned off. I was just sitting and having a good time, and the captain said, folks, we have a very smooth flight. I'm turning off the seat belt. And if you want to get around, please feel free to. And I shouldn't have done this. I opened my laptop. And the only thing I did was I typed NPM install. Turbulence immediately. And the light, uh, seat belt uh, sign comes on. I'm like, sorry. And I turned off the laptop, never to open it again on that flight. And it's kind of scary when you see things like this. But the other day, I was working with a client of mine. And he said, oh, we used to run all these tests, but we quit running them recently. I said, why would you quit running your test? He said, because we upgraded some of our dependencies, and the test started breaking. We don't have time to fix it. I looked at the, uh, and, and I, this was a JavaScript project, and I said, gosh, how many dependencies do you have? Without missing a beat, he said, oh, we got about 150 dependencies. I said, for this small project, he kind of shrugged and said, uh-huh. And I said, why are you using 150 dependencies on this project? 
He kind of said matter of the factly, he said, because we found them. And that is a, such a true thing, isn't it? You are out to lunch with your team, you're having food. In the next table, somebody talk about this XYZ package, and you're like, have you heard about it? 30 minutes later, it's in production code, right? And this is the world we live in. We drag dependency like we are crazy. Well, the point really is, I was mentioning this the other day, and a developer told me, oh, we don't have this problem. I was like surprised. I said, really? How do you deal with dependencies then if you don't have this problem? And he said, oh, we use Maven, he said. I had to remind him, nobody uses Maven. Maven uses you. So the point really is, and of course, to be fair, it's not the Maven's problem, it's the dependency's problem. Dependency uses you through Maven. And you get dragged in, you get sucked in, you get beaten down, and that's what happens to you when you deal with dependencies. So the point really is, we have to manage dependencies, that's what we have to do, otherwise it becomes absolutely ridiculous to deal with. So what can we do about it? Well, dependencies are hard to maintain, and they become obsolete very quickly, and they become incompatible. So we have to be very careful in dragging in dependencies. It takes maybe a dollar to bring in a dependency, but I bet it takes a lot more to take it out. It is easy to drag things in, very difficult to rip them apart. And a lot of times the people who are trying to rip them apart are not the people who brought them in. This is something I've noticed as a consultant over and over and over. Anytime I point to a problem and ask the question, why is this like this? The team's immediate response is, oh, Venkat, we want you to know the people who wrote that no longer work here. This is how this uh, conversation always starts, isn't it? Because it's somebody else who has left us all this legacy for us to deal with, and now it's our problem. Well, when it comes to this, I want to mention about one other thing that I think we have to be careful about. And I call this as technology infatuation. I'm not here to tell you the past was better than uh, today. But in certain ways, it was different and we were able to manage things maybe a little better. So in the, is the technology the right choice for you? You have to ask the question. And one of the questions I will always start with is reversibility. How reversible is the software decision you are going to make, a design decision you're going to make, how can you reverse out of it? If it is easier to reverse out when you realize this was not the smartest decision to make, if you can reverse out of it, we are in a better shape, we can make the decision a little lightly. If it is hard to reverse out, we have to take more time to commit to this decision. For example, the ability to back out of the design or architectural decisions. Now, in that regard, think about libraries and think about frameworks. Now, libraries essentially are a little bit more manageable. The use of a library is easier to reverse than the use of a framework. Well, that's true, but we have to be a bit careful. I would ask the question about the surface area. Surface area, for example, if this is a library, and if my code depends on it like this, my surface area is quite big. And if I want to rip this library out, there's a lot of ripping I have to do because there's a bigger surface area connected to it. On the other hand, if I plan a little ahead, I can keep my surface area relatively small towards this library. So tomorrow, if I decide to modify this and rip it out and replace it, it's a lot easier for me to replace it because the surface area is relatively small. So when it comes to libraries, we can make reversibility a lot easier by managing the surface area. Unfortunately, though, frameworks are very different from libraries. You call into a library, but the framework grows around you. And when the framework grows around you, it becomes a lot harder because by definition or by their nature, the surface area is a lot bigger in that regard. Here's a dumb analogy if you really think about it. Using a library is like dating. Using a framework is like entering into marriage. Be very careful in making this decision. One you can flirt with and you can make a, a change your mind. The other one is going to be really hurtful and expensive. So we need to really think about this. Is this what we really mean? Is this what we really wanted? And then we have to make the decision, not too lightly though. So that is one thing to think about in terms of reversibility. One is more reversible or easier to reversible than the other one. And we have to be a bit careful in how we make the decision moving forward. So when I was young, 
I used to, there was, there was no internet. And this is always fun to talk to children about. They always look at me and say, what do you mean you don't have internet when you were a child? Well, if I wanted to use something, I would read about them in magazines. And then you go to the procurement department, ask for their permission to acquire it. And then when they eventually deliver it, you had a tape drive you have to go to and install it and ins run it through it. When a tape drive is involved between you and the software, you don't uh, download and you, know, you don't use software so quickly. Today, we live in the world of downloading. In a click of a button, we can have all the software we need. And so it is a lot more easier to integrate and bring things in. But we also have to ask the question, are we really increasing the cost of doing things? This leads to what I would like to call as a resume-driven development. And a lot of times when you look at people, you ask them, why are you using this one? Oh, because it's great to have this on my resume. So we have to ask the question, is this needed for the product we are developing? Well, I always say, Keep the learning separate from your production code. We have to continuously learn. And I would create small projects, pet projects, and site projects. I would learn the most with new technology and have the wisdom of not throwing them in production until I find out that it is really the right choice. So we have to kind of keep a two-pronged approach, uh, taking time to learn separately, and then be very prudent in bringing technology for adoption into our own projects. But I'll share with you one uh, story that, uh, that, uh, that breaks my heart, and I call this as the tale of infatuation. This was a time when the economy was really bad in the US, and, and we were really having a hard time hiring people for our project as well. At that time, we were interviewing candidates, and we came across one candidate who was absolutely amazing. And we were on a project for a fairly small company. This was not a mega billion corporation. It was a small company. And as I was working with them, we wanted to really hire somebody. We had a, a, a product to release in the next six months. And when we uh, interviewed this candidate, I was blown away by this candidate. And my boss came to, came to me and said, hey, uh, what do you think of this candidate? I said, oh, don't waste your time talking to me. Hire him. He's the best candidate I've ever seen. And then my boss said, yeah, yeah, but what do you think of the framework he's been developing? I said, that's the best framework I've ever seen, but don't waste your time talking to me. Go hire the person. And then the boss said, what do you think of us using the framework? I said, you know, sit down for a minute. Don't even talk about it. We don't want the framework. Hire the person for what he can deliver. Let's get the project moving. Let's finish this project. Six months later, you want to do anything you want. I'll give you the full support. We'll work together to do any of those. He said, Venkat, did you notice how this framework gave us a persistent uh, messaging? I said, you never use the two words together in a sentence till today. Why are you saying this now? And he went on to say many more things. And I kept saying, you never send this, this in one sentence. Don't do this. Don't talk about the framework. Hire the person. A week went by. I remember very clearly Wednesday afternoon. I'm sitting and coding at my desk. My boss comes and sits on my desk and says, I got a good news for you, Venkat. I said, what is it? We hired the person, and he has, he has agreed to come and work with us. I said, I can't be happier. I'm so excited because I'm going to learn so much from him. I'm absolutely selfish. I'm here to learn, and we will, we're going to have fun times. I can't tell you how happy I am. And my boss said, oh, as part of the hiring contract, we decided to use the framework. I said, uh, please tell me you are kidding. He's like, no, 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 this has been committed already. I said, well, if that's the case, I just quit. He said, oh, I know you're going to say this. I already told my boss that you're going to quit the minute I say this to you. I said, at least I'm predictable. I'm happy for that. Well, good luck with it. I packed my stuff. In five minutes, I was out. I said, if there's any other project, call me. I would like to come and work with you guys. But this is not the right project for me. I don't want to be here telling you every day you made a mistake. And this is one of the few days I went home on time. My wife, of course, as, as the person she is, looked at me and said, you are home early. I said, yes, I quit. And, I, and she said, what does that mean you quit? I said, I don't have a job. That's what it means. And she said, in that case, I got some dishes for you in the kitchen. And that's basically how we did this. For a couple of weeks, I was home doing dishes. And then I found a job and I moved on. But 16 months later, I'm not even kidding with you, 16 months later, we were supposed to finish this in six months, sorry, 18 months later, a year and a half later. My phone rings, hello? Hey, Venkat, hey, how's it going? I go ahead and say it. I said, what do you mean go ahead and say it? Go ahead and say it, I told you so. I said, I'm really sorry, I didn't want to hear this. What happened? Oh, we spent the past year and a half writing more code for the framework. Remember this framework we didn't need in the first place. And we have not still released the product. I said, I'm really sorry to hear it, but what can I do for you when you call me? 
I was wondering if you'll come and help us. I said, no, there's a reason I quit. There's no reason for me to come now when it's in a bigger failure, so sorry. And, and, and six more months went by, two years after I quit. The phone rings again, and he says, come over, just one day, write a report and leave. I said, wow, you guys are done. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, what, what do you want me to do? Well, pay you, for, pay you for the day, just one day gig, come and write a report and leave. And I went there 8 in the morning, and I sit in the front of the computer, and there's a little instruction how to use it. I enter this little key. I click the button. 25 seconds later, the window popped up. And I time it again. I profile it. And I said, look, that click 20, took 25 seconds. He's like, uh-huh. And then I did a profile, and I said, that click resulted in a creation of 1,863 objects. He said, it's object-oriented. <laughs> and I said, database, don't talk about it. This is the fastest you will get. Uh, processing power, don't talk about it. This is the fastest you will get. In production, it's all much slower. And then I said, where's the team? He wouldn't answer. I said, no, tell me, where's the team? And that's when I knew they fired the entire team. So here's the software that poorly performs and nobody to work on it because they were so angry. And then I looked at him and said, you didn't call me to write a report, did you? Why did you call me here? He said, fix it. I'm like, sorry, I'm not a magician. I'm just a mortal programmer. And I had to escape from the building. But the point really is, it's very scary when people get infatuated. And so don't build what you can download, but please don't download what you really don't need. And this is one of the problems we are living with today is that infatuation to technology. And I always ask the people, is what kind of decision you made? How much did you put effort into deciding this is the right software to use? And if we didn't take the time to decide, we are going to become a prey for the technology infatuation, and that's going to hurt us a lot. So I'm going to talk about accidental complexity. Let's take a quick look at one example here. We looked at a problem and said to ourselves, I can use a pool of threads. Now we have a pool of problems to deal with. Now here's an example, a Boolean variable done, and it's false to begin with. I have a loop right here, as you can see, which is just looping through and waiting for done to turn into true. Hey, this is all great, and eventually after two second delay, I'm setting true to, uh, done to true. If I run this code, it should really work, isn't it? Well, that's actually called the hope, if you will. So let me go ahead and run the code. You can see the program starting up in main. It's running. It set the done to true, but it never completes after that. Now, why didn't it complete? And I will add insult to injury here. Just go back to this code and say try right here on a catch exception. And to add insult to injury, simply say uh, over here, a thread dot sleep zero. How about that? Just a sleep zero. And then, of course, when I run the code after a thread sleep zero, you will see that the program actually quits. Why would a zero of a sleep actually make a difference? Well, the reason for this is the concurrency model in Java was built based on the Java memory model. A lot of developers did not understand the Java memory model when they actually started using it. And this can be really problematic. And as a result, the complexity of concurrency is so enormous that most of us cannot really comprehend it. And I would argue that the JDK concurrency model is the assembly language of concurrent programming. How many of you here program in assembly? Not a, not a, well, a few people. I want to thank the people who raised the hand. You are doing it so the rest of us don't have to do it. And, and that is the whole point. Concurrency should be exactly that. A few people have to soldier through it so the rest of us can, can have a peaceful life after that. So a key design skill we need to develop is the ability to discern accidental complexity from inherent complexity. In the same token, I'm going to say imperative style of programming is more complex than functional and declarative style of programming. And so imperative style is packed with accidental complexity, but that's what we've been doing for a good 30 years as mainstream programming is doing imperative style of programming. And if we can really go towards declarative and functional style, we can ease that pain quite a bit, and declarative really reduces that accidental complexity. The last thing I want to talk about here is called entwinement. And this is something a lot of us fall into a trap. Entwinement is where we take two ideas, 
that do not belong with each other, belong to each other, uh, with each other, and they mix them together. Now, we make this mistake, but the folks who were behind the JDK made this mistake as well. Here's an example. A resource class uses an external resource. You want to clean it up uh, properly, maybe a file, a database connection, uh, a, web, a socket, whatever. How do we do that in the past? We write the finalize method. But the problem is the finalize method is not called until the garbage collector kicks in. The garbage collector will not kick in unless it needs the memory. Now we are tying an uh, automatic garbage collector, which is not deterministic to external resources. This is a terrible idea. And in fact, it's so terrible that JDK 9 deprecated, Java 9 deprecated finalize. In fact, Rich Hickey puts this in a nice words. He says, complexing things is a source of complexity, he says. This is a new word he invented called complexing, but it really stands for entwinement. When you're taking two things that don't belong together and you mix them together, really bad things happen. And we see this a lot in our own programming. If you ask me, Venkat, have you ever done this in your code? I will give you examples. Oh, yes, I've absolutely done this uh, problem uh, error in my code, and I've suffered the consequences of it. And, and we see this a lot in a, a lot of different areas. We definitely want to remove this kind of complexity from code by removing entwinement. And in the case of Java, they realized it, and they got rid of it in Java 9, but uh, they've been working on it for several years. So we talk about these kinds of problems when it comes to complexity, too many moving parts, invisible changes, uncontrolled mutability, lack of cohesion, uh, expense, uh, uh, very excessive uh, amount of dependencies, infatuation towards technology without determining the real need, uh, low level of concurrency usage, imperative style coding, too much of that, and then of course, entwinement. I'm gonna finally say we should learn to deal with complexity but we should also have the wisdom to minimize it. And this is a responsibility of every single one of us who are calling ourselves technical because only technical people truly understand these and only we are capable of really reducing and dealing with this. So we should learn to deal with complexity and have the wisdom to minimize it. A maintainable code, I'm gonna say, is a gift we give ourselves for the future. Hope that was useful, thank you.